Good morning. Uh, this is a little different this year. I'm used to it being at 8 o'clock on Friday morning after the coaches have been in Jackson all week and uh, early risers up for this, but uh, do welcome you all to the rule changes for football for the 2020 uh, school year. Uh, before we get into, guys, the rule changes, there are a couple of things that I would like to make. I, I would like to make a, a statement to you as coaches and, and possibly ADs, and then you carry it back to your ADs. Just a reminder that this year is a reclassification year, and we'll need to get on that as, as soon as possible in September so that we can get our numbers uh, and get that process carried on. Also, uh, brackets for all of our playoffs should be up soon. Uh, please wait two or three weeks before you start calling and asking for the brackets. Uh, it's a long time to play off for any sport, but we will have those brackets up as soon as possible. Remind you again that this year we are using Scorebook Live uh, to <coughs> record your scores on, so make sure that you are familiar and have access with that. Uh, never make a talk to coaches at, at our high schools without mentioning, first of all, sportsmanship and how that you need to conduct yourselves in, in a manner that uh, in a manner that, that makes your school and yourself look good. And remember that the fans and the assistant coaches and the players uh, follow your lead in, in your actions both on and off the field. How the treatment of officials, make sure you have someone meeting officials when they arrive at your place, getting them on and off the field at halftime and off the field and to their vehicles and uh, out of town even uh, after the game. <clears throat> Try to keep our visitors and our home side separate. Now, I know we have three or four venues around the state that have uh, visitors, uh, home people sitting on the visitor side. Uh, that is not recommended. However, that does not violate a rule. But I don't have to remind you of the times that we, we're in and how people are and how lawsuits are filed on a daily basis. So might do your best for crowd control on these. Right before we get into these rule changes, I will tell you that uh, Mississippi with the NFHS is what they call a 100% state. So all of you coaches, all of our officials can go online to nfhs.org. You can download a PowerPoint of all of this rules presentations. You can also download you a football rule book and a football case book uh, to have and all that is free of charge because we are a hundred percent state uh, with our officials and, and with uh, what we do within the realms of this morning our, our football rules. I am on the rules committee for the state of Mississippi. Uh, the football rules committee is one of the is not one of the is the largest committee uh, for rules up there. Uh, we we're still have one representative from each state. So sometimes if you, when you wonder why rules are not changed very quickly, imagine trying to get a 66% majority or a 60% majority, whichever one it is, I forget, uh, out of 50 people on rule changes uh, for football. When you have a mixture of, of football coaches, state association people, officials, administrators, ranging anywhere from, from uh, say 30 years old to 80 years old on that committee. So you have the old school football folks and new school football folks and sometimes those rules just don't get passed. Uh, if you have any rule changes that you would like to see us look at at the National Federation, if you will email those to me, I will put them on a form and send them in so that they can be considered. We're always open to uh, looking at new rules. The new rules for the 2000 football season, the rule changes. 
First of all, this is new this year. Uh, it's been on the agenda for quite some time at the National Federation. Uh, before the game, prior to the game, the head coach will notify the referee <clears throat> who is going to be the designated representative, either coach or player, who will make the decisions regarding the penalty and either accepting it or declining it. Those of you that's been around the game for a long time know that it used to be the captain on the field made the call. Then we got to looking at coaches, and then one, one official now will, will ask the captain, and another will look at the coach. Before the game begins, the white hat should come over to you. If not, you look him up, and you tell him who is going to be making this decision on whether to accept or decline a penalty. If it's you, they will look directly at you, the, the umpire or the field judge, back judge will come over and tell the white hat what the penalty is. He will signal you the penalty, tell you what it is, and then he will ask if you are going to accept it or decline it. So make sure that you take care of that. Another question we're often asked, and this is new for 2020, as are all of these, uh, if there is a rain delay or a lightning delay in the first half, uh, can we cut halftime short? So the new rule going forward beginning this year, the halftime intermission may be short by mutual agreement of the two coaches if a weather delay occurs during the last three minutes of the first half. So if it's within three minutes of the first half, both coaches can get together and say, we only want a 10 minute halftime or eight minute half time or five minute half time. You have to have a mandatory three minute warm up period. So uh, that that is between the coaches. Coaches, if you want uh, only a 10 minute half time and the other coach won't agree to it, then you have a regular half time. So both coaches have to get together on that. Uh, so make sure that, that you do this and once again, this is if that delay occurs only in the last three minutes of the first half. The next rule change concerns the 40-second play clock. I will have to say last year was our first year to have the 40-second play, play clock. I had a lot of reservations about using it uh, in our state. I was afraid that we, we just could not uh, get everything together in that. I, I will say the very first night, opening night of football, I went to a game. It was a little shaky, maybe for the first half of the first quarter. But after that, the official crew picked it up and it went like clockwork. And I think this is a rule that has made a big difference in the speed of the game and our players and everybody being ready to play when the ball is snapped. Now, <clears throat> this new rule was made to eliminate a, a potential timing advantage that would be gained by the defense. The rules committee approved the play that the play clock being set to 40 seconds when the official's timeout is taken for an injury to a defensive player or a defensive player has an equipment issue. This was uh, brought up to me also by some of our coaches saying that uh, during the fourth quarter of the game, especially as the game was running down, that a defensive player would say he had uh, something wrong with his equipment and it had to be changed out. Uh, this will reset the play clock to 40 seconds and we'll take care of it from there. Also, uh, there's a new uh, clarification for the 25 second play clock. Following a legal kick, when either team is awarded a new series, the play clock will be set to 25 seconds. So after a kickoff or a punt, it is a, a legal kick, and the team receives it and is awarded a new series, they'll be set to 25 seconds. Another new rule, and we had more this year. Usually only two or three of these get passed. Uh, this year there was uh, about six of them or seven of them, not counting editorial changes. Uh, that is out of 44 proposals that, that were on the agenda when we uh, arrived in Indianapolis. 
The next one is, is about disconcerting act file and a penalty. It's all reclassified. Now, disconcerting act, guys, is a little bit of too, too big a word for, for me. Basically, this is a penalty against the defense when a linebacker or a defensive end or someone is backed off of the line of scrimmage and is lunging toward the line of scrimmage without uh, without crossing it, trying to draw the offensive uh, line offside. That would be a disconcerting act. Uh, or it could even be words spoken by the defense, trying to uh, do the snap count or, or, or just say hut or whatever, trying to make the center mess up. Any of this that is caught by the officials uh, will be a, a penalty, but that penalty has changed from 15 yards to only five yards. So it's, it's only a five yard penalty now instead of a 15. One of the biggest rule changes this year, and this one has been fought far ever since I've been up there, is spiking the ball just to conserve time. Up until now, the center had to go underneath the center and receive the snap hand-to-hand -hand from the center in order to spike the ball. That rule has now been changed. The exception to allow a player to conserve time by intentionally throwing the ball forward to the ground immediately after receiving the snap has been expanded to include any player positioned directly behind the center this exception now includes snaps that are not hand-to-hand. -hand. So from the pistol formation, from the shotgun formation, if the quarterback is positioned right behind the center, he can take the snap and he can throw it directly into the ground and that will stop the clock uh, and, and there will be no penalty for that. That was, man, that was, I, I cannot tell you how long that discussion went on about what if the quarterback fumbles the snap and if he clearly fumbles it and then gains control and throws it, there, there's going to be a penalty. If someone's trying to cut in front of, between the quarterback and the center and, and get the snap, he cannot spike the ball. It has to be to the person right behind the ball and he has to secure the ball and immediately throw it straight into the ground in order for it to be a legal, uh, what we call, spike. So that, that concludes the rule changes. Uh, there are some points of emphasis I, I want to go over. Number one I've mentioned briefly is sportsmanship. Uh, I, I, want, I want you to know that sportsmanship, according to the NFHS and also uh, to us, most of us, when we're thinking about sportsmanship, we think about how the players are conducting themselves towards each other, how the coaches are, are, are hollering or screaming at the officials or players or the other team, God forbid, are the officials screaming at the coaches. Uh, we've had that before also. But it's just not the game participants. It's just not the ones that are on the field. Well then, it's, it's, it's those that are at the game. Players and coaches are the most visible I, by far at a game uh, in their displays of sportsmanship. But we also need to include talks or training or, or handouts or something about sportsmanship too. Number one, public address announcers. Guys, it's, it's real bad when, you, when you're visiting somewhere in the public address announcer thinks that he's a, uh, a broadcaster on the radio and he's calling the whole game out and, and he's trying to tell the, the defensive back where to be or he's trying to tell what a bad call the officials made or I was at a game two years ago where the public address announcer just said the coach is stupid for calling that play and it was his coach. So we need to make sure that our public address announcers clean up how they do that. We have, we have an insert in our handbook that is online uh, for public address announcers and the way they are supposed to call a game. It also includes bands. 
Vans can be unsportsmanlike in, in their behavior. So we need to talk to our, our band directors and our cheerleaders and our cheer coaches and our dance teams and then also our spectators. I will say once again that spectators are great. We couldn't survive without them. But what a job of a spectator, if you want to say they have a job, is to cheer encouragement for their team, not to lamb blast the other team or the officials or the other coaching staff or the other spectators. So let's try to make a concerted effort this year to clean all of this up uh, at our ball games. It, it will be looked at. Another point of emphasis this year, uh, and you see this, guys, every week. And the reason we see it in high school is because we see it on Saturday when we're watching college football, and we see it on Sunday when we're watching the NFL. Intentional grounding. In high school, it is still intentional grounding if the quarterback is rolling out of the pocket and all his receivers are covered and someone's coming up to sack him and he throws it out of bounds right up in the stand. Under the NFHS rules, unless using the legal exception in rule 752E, that's the, what we just went over with the quarterback, intentional grounding is a foul whenever a forward pass is thrown to prevent a loss of yardage or to conserve time are to an area not occupied by an eligible receiver. High school referees, and they're all going to be made aware of this, guys. High school referees need to be aware of these situations and with the help of the line judge and the linesman, make the correct call under the National Federation of High School Rules. So I, I am going to caution you. I'm not going to tell you you're not going to see it. But I, I saw it almost every Friday night last year where a quarterback got in trouble and like he sees them do on Saturday, threw the ball out of bounds beyond the line of scrimmage. There was no receiver there. He was clearly throwing the ball away to prevent the sack and there was no flag on the play. Because those same officials watch those same games we do on Saturday and Sunday and Monday night and Thursday night, whenever. But this year, that is going to be emphasized with our officials to make the correct call. Uh, the, the rules committee, when we, we looked at this, we felt like we needed to do something to emphasize that rule because what you're doing, if, if you do not call that, is you're allowing or you're punishing the defense for making good plays for covering all the receivers and for getting a good rush on the quarterback or keeping him in the pocket or whatever, whichever way you want to describe it. And we do not need to penalize the defense for making a good play. We need to penalize the offense for throwing it out of bounds to conserve yardage or to conserve time, uh, either one. The last point of, of emphasis, well, there, there's actually two combined into one. Over the years in high school, as football has, has evolved from the old power I formation of the T formation with two tight ends into what we have now with receivers spread all over the field and the shotgun of the pistol formation, ineligible downfield with, with linemen, or, or not just linemen, but, but uh, athletes, players who are not eligible to go out for a pass. Is I, I've seen tackles 15 yards downfield with nothing caught. I've also seen it called the other way, guys, where there is a two-yard variance there uh, where he, may, he barely got off the line of scrimmage and they may have caught it. That's a judgment call. But this is a point of emphasis with our officials and with you this year. A player may not advance beyond the expanded neutral zone on a legal forward pass play before a legal forward pass that crosses the neutral zone is in flight. The neutral zone it, it expands two yards behind the defensive line of scrimmage following the snap. So you can fire off two yards, but that's it until the ball is thrown and passes the neutral zone. All you offensive line coaches, be sure that you 
uh, go over this with your offensive linemen because they've been getting downfield. So, so make sure players who are illegally downfield is important. Make sure that the A player is clearly beyond the expanded neutral zone. We don't want to call it if it's two yards and he's two yards and, and one foot over. I don't want that call, and you don't want that call. But if he's five to ten yards or more downfield, yes, we want it caught. We've got to stay within the rules. And, and on the uh, flip side of that, that goes along with it, is on a line of scrimmage formation. Only one player, only one player may not be on the line, but still penetrate the vertical plane through the waistline of his nearest teammate who is on the line. Guys, without showing you a picture of this. This is, this is someone who's lined up in what would be the tight end position, but instead of lining up on the line, the wide receiver's walked up, so he backs off the line, but he don't back off far enough so the defense can distinguish that he is no longer on the line of scrimmage. He has to back up where his helmet clears the butt of the closest down linesman to him. Uh, so make, make sure that we go and, and, and teach all of that. And on those points of emphasis, again, coaches, we're going to emphasize that with the officials. And once again, I'm going to tell you, sometimes they may call it and sometimes may not. They may not, but that, that's our problem. But it's, I'm telling you, it's going to be emphasized, they're going to be aware of it, and they're going to be looking for it. Uh, that is all of the 2020 football rule changes. This is the time we usually take for questions. I will tell you this, if you have any questions after reviewing this, uh, feel free to email me those questions and that way, that way you will have it in writing how I answered it and not just uh, a voice answer. Now, unless it's in writing, it, it may not be that way. If, it's, if I've told you something and it's in writing, then that's the way it's got to be. Uh, once again, guys, appreciate what you do, all the, all the work that you do. It's been a hard year for us. We didn't even get to finish our spring sports. Uh, we didn't get to finish school. We had to adjust our summer workouts. And hopefully, uh, by the time that you're viewing this, School is scheduled to start. Uh, we're back at it full speed, and good luck to you this year on Friday nights. Thank you.